hang out. We, we're going to take a break from uh, our First Timothy sermon series. Um, as I said, Chris was going to preach this week, and I, I called him up and I said, hey, can you preach the following week? But uh, I can't, I already gave him a, a passage to preach on, and I'm really looking forward to what he's going to bring to First Timothy chapter 3. And so I'm, I'm just going to kind of preach a standalone sermon, uh, and it's, it's going to be a sermon about my processing, right? So uh, you are all my therapist for today, and I'm going to kind of work through and process this with you. Uh, one of the things uh, that I felt an immense pressure for was, uh, as I lost a very, very close friend, um, I just, I needed time to process, right? Like, it, it just took a while for me to process, and I was in a really rough place, and so, um, as I processed it, I, I processed it with God, and uh, this is kind of how I put it all together. So you, you're going to kind of see that. It might be a mess of a sermon. If so, I'm sorry. Uh, but we're going to look through and we're going to narrow down on Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. If you want to turn there as I, uh, as I kind of start out, I, I'm going to be solely in that passage. But first I want to talk about the Methodist uh, the founder of the Methodist movement. His name was John Wesley. And uh, we're in a Methodist church. There's tons of Methodist churches out there. Uh, some are good and some are not so good. I think uh, Wesley would love some of these churches and not love some of the other ones. Um, the really interesting thing about John Wesley was he studied scripture his whole life. Uh, one of the most influential people in all of Christianity was Susanna Wesley because of how deeply she invested in her children. Uh, she was the daughter of a pastor, the husband, or the wife of a pastor, <clears throat> and had many of her kids joined the pastorate as well. And she taught John Wesley Greek and Latin and Hebrew, and so Wesley was steeped in scripture from a very early age. And he ended up going to study at Oxford University, the most prestigious religious institution at the time. And he was well-learned, well-read in the classics and all of that stuff. He was part of a group called the Holiness Club. Sounds like a club you guys want to join, right? The Holiness Club, it sounds like a lot of fun and all of that stuff. And they would come together and focus on how to live a well-disciplined life. That's what they would do together. And so Wesley invested a ton of time in doing this. And after graduating, he decided to go to America. And at this time, America was just colonies. And uh, he went, he thought it would be a great opportunity to evangelize the, the heathens, right? The, the Native American people. Um, and he also would work with the colonies there and he began to set up different things. And what happened was his uh, missionary trip to the Americas was an utter failure. Like, just like he left uh, with a arrest warrant out for him. Like, that is what was going on. He uh, did not offer communion. He, he was infatuated with uh, a lady at the time, uh, and she rejected that lady, and uh, she went to come and get communion, and he rejected communion. And yes, he had an arrest warrant for rejecting communion at that time, um, but it was totally John Wesley's fault. Uh, he kind of let his heart get in the way. So he viewed this as an utter failure. And on the trip back, there's this really famous story where uh, they hit this huge storm and a bunch of Moravians, um, which were pietists at the time, were on the boat with him. And as the storm was 
looking like it was going to capsize the boat. John Wesley was scared for his life, just as you and I might be, right? Where he is ready to die, and what he saw in the Moravians was that they were singing praises to God. Even the children were singing praises to God and rejoicing. In the midst of chaos, in the midst of the storm, they were praising God. And John Wesley, in his journal, says this, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? Who? What is he that will deliver me from this evil heart of mischief? I have a fair summer religion. I can talk well, nay, and believe myself, while no danger is near. But let death look me in the face, and my spirit is troubled. Nor can I say, to die is to gain. In the storm, I think, what if the gospel be not true? In this moment, Wesley realized that his mind was sharp, but his faith was weak. Did he really trust in Jesus? And the, the real question here is being Christian, is just being Christian in name really enough? Can you know this stuff? Can you uh, semi-believe this stuff, but yet have a transformed heart that is where your faith rests truly on Jesus? Or is this a faith because you've had a good life, you've received comfort or prosperity? As I was going through this rough week, I thought of John Wesley and that moment of realizing that his faith was weak. He ended up uh, hearing a reading of Luther's preface to the uh, of Romans, and he says, my heart grew strangely warm. And after that moment, Wesley began to preach heart religion, a shift from, hey, we can believe all these things, we can live a, a Christian life to say, no, I need to be transformed in my heart by the gospel day in and day out. As I walked through this week and uh, I felt shock, I felt uh, doubt, I felt numbness, I felt fear, I felt loss, and I felt guilt. You see, um, Nick was one of my closest friends. And I, I want to lay this out for you a little bit. When I first got married, Nick was the one to offer me marital advice. When I had uh, unreasonable expectations of my wife, Nick said, uh, Shane, you're stupid. Like, you cannot think that. Like, you can't think that your wife's going to do all these things. Uh, Nick came to me right after I was married, and uh, I got drunk with a fellow ministry leader. And Nick came to me and said, you can't do that. Now, I knew that I couldn't do that, but he was the one who came to me and lovingly rebuked me. Nick uh, would, uh, me, Nick and I would go on many car rides. And when I moved back to Connecticut and my wife took our only car to the hospital to be with her mother who was dying, it was Nick who I called that drove me to the hospital to be with my wife. Uh, Nick and I would sit alone in cars and talk all the time. Nick gave me a very early on pastoral affirmation. I ministered with Nick. We uh, developed a multi-church young adults group. I discipled with Nick. Like when we're sitting, and when I'm pushing discipleship and I'm sitting in discipleship groups, like 10 years ago, I was sitting in a discipleship group with Nick. I prayed with Nick. I cried with Nick. Nick planned my bachelor party and my 22nd birthday. 
all of these things were uh, things that he did. He's an important part of my life. Uh, and I, I felt a deep pain and loss. And so I'm going to show you the deep, dark part of my soul this morning. Um, I began to think, how is this winning? How does the, the death of this man winning? At 35 years old, I, I, I could not process this. Uh, how does this glorify God? Right? Maybe you were thinking this, but you don't want to say it out loud. We're in a, a church. Maybe you think God will strike you down if you think that in a church. I will say uh, that's the God Zeus, which we don't believe in. That's a pagan God. We believe in Yahweh, the God of the Bible. He's not going to strike you with a thunderbolt. There is certainly, he is certainly a God of protecting, protecting the sacred and we have to be careful of that. But these questions, I think, are important to wrestle with. And I found uh, myself in Psalm 6 agreeing with David as he said, My soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord, how long? My eyes grow weak with sorrow. And I'm going to be honest. Then something else came. After my first reaction, there was some guilt there, right? I'm a, I'm a pastor. I can't have these feelings. I, I oh, yes, can't be can. doing that. And then I began to think of being so busy the past six months that I hadn't even spoken to Nick. And I, I began to wrestle with that. And I felt no desire to stand up here and be vulnerable. None. I like. I did not want to do that. I did not want to talk about this. And yet, there are so many times that I've preached vulnerability, and yet I cannot go there myself. Um, and so that's where I was at. And maybe you're feeling a bit uncomfortable. And uh, if you're being truthful, you feel a little bit uncomfortable right now. There, there should be a, a little bit of uncomfort. I would be uncomfortable if I was in yours. Or maybe you're embarrassed or afraid or uneasy. Nope. But I just want to ask the question, like, how is it possible that we win by losing? Where is there hope for the hopeless? And I, my mind just came to Colossians chapter 2 verse 13 through 15, which says this, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the power and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Here's, here's the thing about Christianity, and here's the thing about the gospel it doesn't make any sense. The gospel does not make sense. In fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians says it's foolishness to the Greeks. And you got to remember, when Paul is writing this, the best minds of the whole world, the best philosophical minds, the best writers, all of the literature came from the Greeks. And it is foolishness to the Greeks. And then he says it's a stumbling block to Jews. Christ crucified cannot be possible, for cursed is anybody who is hung on a tree. The gospel that is proclaimed through the cross is foolishness to the Greeks and a stumbling block to Jews. Because when there is no hope, that this is the point, when there is no hope in the midst of despair, when we are dead, 
When we are dead, then Christ comes. When we have no shot, then Christ comes. And I, I really want to drive this home. I want to I get the picture. I want you to imagine yourself getting caught up with the wrong crowd. Maybe you've been selling drugs, or uh, maybe you've been gambling your money away, and before you kind of get in that thing like, I'm, I'm too holy for that, I just want you to imagine that you have gotten into the wrong crowd. And this wrong crowd kidnaps you, binds you up, takes you on a helicopter, and drops you in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, 2,000 miles away from any land that you can possibly reach. And as you are drowning there, as the waves are so high that you're fearful of drowning, you're realizing, oh man, this is I'm in over my head, literally, and I have no shot. As you swim and swim and you feel like you get nowhere, as you have fear of whatever is in the ocean below you, as you have fear that your strength is about to give out and you can no longer swim and you are going to die from drowning, as you're at the point where you're frustrated at your captors for all that they've done in your life, all the things that they have pounded against you, and in the midst of that, you realize, oh man, like, I'm partly to blame for this. I have done the wrong things. I am in the wrong crowd. And at that point, when you feel like there's no hope, you see a boat. And that boat is coming towards you. And you think, in your mind, what luck. Wow, I'm, I'm really lucky that this boat has come for me. What are the chances? This must be the Coast Guard. I must be part of their route at this moment. I feel so light, lucky. And what you realize is that this boat has the whole time been heading straight towards you. In fact, it knew where you were. It knew your pain. It also knew of all the things that you had done wrong. You were dead in your sins. You were put in a place of uncircumcision of the flesh. What, is, what does that mean? It means that your full disposition, the full way that you were facing, was not towards God. It was fully against God. That's what uncircumcised of the flesh was. You were fully against God. And guess what? This story is not, you got yourself into it, now get yourself out. This story is you got yourself into this. Now let me get you out. That's the story of Jesus. That's the story of the gospel. Like everything wrong that happens to you is the result of the fall, but you're falling too. You're sinful too. I'm sinful too. That is the whole point of this. And the curse is spreading and we're all throwing muck at each other because we're all sinning. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But Colossians says that he canceled the charge of our debt. He canceled the charge of of our death, nailing it to the cross. Think of a debt collection agency. No, not the uh, not the people who call and say uh, your service is out of warranty or whatever. No, like you owe a debt, and they are looking to collect that, and they're writing notes of, "Hey, you owe this debt to this person." for this charge. You get it in the mail, you open it up, and you see it. And that is this, my doubt. I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, searching doubt. Like, that, that's not what I'm saying. I actually don't think that that's a sin. As we doubt God, if it's a searching doubt, if it's a, if it's a deep doubt of saying, like, God, I, I just want to know your heart, 
and my heart's unsteady, I think that that's a holy pursuit. I'm talking like true doubt, like almost a hands out, I don't want to talk to you, God, because I, I just can't handle you right now. Why would you do this doubt? Think of that doubt and that charge. Doubt, chains doubt. Nailed to this cross. Or the sexual immorality that I did before I got married. And the charge is written out and it's nailed to that cross. The time uh, maybe I drove drunk or I guilted my spouse into believing something for my own gain. Hung up there on the cross. Nailed to it. It's there. And guess what? You guys all get to see it. No, that, that might sound scary. That might sound like, oh man, like, is God trying to embarrass me? Put all my shame on there? Is, he, is God trying to shame me by nailing it to the cross? No, the point of it being nailed to the cross is not to shame you, not to embarrass you, but to show what our Lord has done. To show what Christ has done through the cross. My failures are not just the failures of a person, but they show Christ's glory. I am redeemed by one of the biggest losses of all time, of the crucified Savior. I'm redeemed by a loss. Satan thought he won, but he crucified the Savior, showing that, oh yeah, look, men rejected you, Jesus. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. You thought that you could come to save the world, but they rejected you and hung on a cross. Satan wants to think that he has won. And, and I just want to say this. That's why when we look at the cross, we cannot just look at it with joy, but also with sadness. Deep sadness. Yeah, we know the end of the story. It doesn't change what had happened there. The rejection of men up there. When, when I think of from the outside, uh, Nick's life looks like a failure. Outside, Satan won, right? I mean, as far, far as the curse is found, death reigns supreme. As far as the curse is found, death reigns supreme. That's Satan's plan. He wants you to see that this man who hoped for the healing of a savior did not receive healing. That he trusted in a God who does not save. These are lies. I'm, I'm saying lies right now, right? But that's what Satan wants to do. He wants to get our attention from the truth. And here's the truth. Here's the promise. That we must believe in all of this. The, the promise is that nothing can stop the Lord from saving. That's the promise. It's a, a promise repeated time and time again through the Old Testament that our God saves, that nothing can stop the Lord from saving. That's the truth of the whole Bible, is that even when it looks like Satan won, even when it looks like there's chaos around, nothing can stop the Lord from saving. Nothing. In Christianity, we win by losing. That's how we win. We win by losing. We give our lives up to the God of the universe to gain our lives. We pick up our cross. And follow him daily. We trust in a crucified Savior. In the cross, Satan thought 
he had victory. Mary God hung on a tree. God, Jesus, being in very nature God, incarnate on this earth, is hung on a tree. Jesus was shamed, hung on the tree naked, passerby receiving insults. He was seen as an insurrectionist, pained and broken. Through it, though, Christ won by losing his life. This passage says, it, I just have been like kind of meditating on this. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Every power and authority, every garbage worldview that is out there that points against Christianity is made as a public spectacle on the cross. That's what it's saying. It is saying that Christ makes a mockery over everything by hanging on a cross. The cross that meant to kill becomes our victory. The curse of the cross. Curse is any man who is hung on the tree. That is biblical. That is from Deuteronomy. That any man who is hung on a tree is cursed by God. Becomes the undoing of the curse in Genesis 3. That the fall of mankind, the undoing of the fall of mankind, is not living upright lives. It's not being holy. It's not doing this or doing that. It is only undone by the curse of the cross that set us free. I think uh, we sometimes shield ourselves from the pain. I've definitely uh, been there this week, shielding myself from the pain. I, I don't want to hear it, and then people say to me, well, Nick was a Christian, right? Yeah, he was a Christian. Uh, well, your great hope is that you get to see him again. And he, yes, that's that's good. That's not where I put my hope. I'll tell you what, though. When I see Nick again, his eyes won't be on me. His eyes will be on his Savior. What is my hope then? Because here, here's the thing, like my, my hope is not just a heavenly one. It's not at the end of all things, everything will be okay, God's going to put everything to right. That is my hope. I do have hope, but it's not just in at the end of all things, at the Feast of the Lamb, when we sit down with our loved ones and all of them are there. That, that's not just where I place my hope. Where I place my hope is even when we are losing. Like, this is a loss. Trust me, this is a loss for us as Christians, this, this man's testimony. But Christ's victory shines through the loss. I heard this uh, quote this week. A ship in the harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are built for. A ship in the harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are built for. A Christian who is living a good, protective life is safe. That's not what Christians are for. A Christian who has protection and doesn't have to suffer and doesn't really have to go through these hard things they're safe. That is not what Christians are built for. We have a watching world. We're called to shine the victory of the cross in our lives. I watched a man struggle with cancer. 
I sat down with Nate, and the night before, he felt like he was having a brain aneurysm. And in that coffee shop, I sat with him as he cried, and he said, I don't want to leave my kids without a father. I, I don't want to do that. I'm scared. I don't want to do that. Yet, he hold, held on to the power of the cross throughout. This is not the Marxian-like phrase that religions are opioids for the populace. This is not, well, he just held on to the cross because, well, he just wanted to uh, have hope that he would live again. It's not that. Marx was wrong. What Marx, Karl Marx, did not realize is it's harder to hold on to the cross when things get tough. It's important to know and realize that the power of the cross has the power to save future and present. It's not just a future hope, it's a present hope. And this is where it's at. This is what I believe that we're called to do. We're called to shine the power of the cross no matter what is going on. <clears throat> and I actually don't think it is to uh, overcome our brokenness and fear by holding on to the power of the cross. No, it's realizing that our God saves in the midst of brokenness, in the midst of fear. When you're out of the ocean 2,000 miles away, it's the power to save. Yes. Nothing can stop the Lord from saving. And that certificate is hung on the tree. Whatever you may be dealing with, whatever you may be struggling with, whatever sin that you just cannot let go from, and certainly God can't save me. Certainly God can't save this sin in my heart. Man, it's, I'm never going to be healed from this. It's never going to happen. There's certificates already up there. You just have to trust in the man who hung on the tree. The interesting thing about the name Jesus, what a, what a beautiful name Jesus is. Because it, it means that Yahweh saves. The center of our Bible is Jesus. We think that the Old Testament points towards Jesus. We read the Old Testament in light of that. We live our lives at the center of that. We hold true to this name Jesus. And while we hold true to that name Jesus, we must remember what that name means, that Yahweh saves. That the God of the universe saves you and I. And, and guess what? Wherever you are right now, whether you think I'm just a madman talking or it's been a really connected with you, I can tell you for certain that Yahweh, the God of the universe, wants a deeper relationship with you through Jesus today and then again tomorrow and again the next day. Because he is the one who saves us when we have no hope. That's the message of the cross. That's heavy stuff. I realize that. Like, I, I'm, I'm here for that. But I can't stop there because that's not the end of the story. I've been preaching about the cross. But you can never preach on the cross without the resurrection. It's not the end of the story because three days later Jesus rose from the dead and defeated death. Where oh death is your victory? Where oh death is your sting? The power of the cross and the resurrection has over 
throne that. And that defeat of death is not just a future hope. It, it is. I'm not trying to lessen that, but I think we all think, yeah, it's a future hope. It was that pie in the sky type attitude. But the resurrection also means there's no fear in death now. But we got to step into it. We got to live into it. That's where we're at. So thank you. I'm Shane Creeby, and this was my TED Talk. Mm -hmm. Would you stand and, and pray with me? <clears throat> King of the universe, God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, we thank you that you are not high and seated above all things, that they, you're not just there, but you care for the lowly. We thank you for Jesus that on the cross you have provided a way for salvation, that our sins, the debt for our sins is hung on the tree with our sins, and that we are now risen up from the dead, that as we are buried with Christ, we rise again from the dead. May we step in to the resurrection today, tomorrow, and forever. In Jesus' name, amen.